Good morning. It is so great to be back with you after a few weeks away. I know that as I did, I'm sure you enjoyed hearing from Pastor Matt and Pastor Jason and from Will the last few weeks. We came uh, to the 8.30, we came to the 10.30, we sat in different spots to get a feel, you know, for what it's like in different places and just loved worshiping with you all and being able to sit together as a family over the last few Sundays. But it's great to be back in the pulpit with you this morning. Today is, as has been mentioned, Sanctity of Life Sunday, and uh, I didn't want to take a break from our series on 1 Corinthians to address that, and so I wrote something on the church blog uh, about Sanctity of Life Sunday and reasons why, as believers, we should stand unapologetically for life and why we should oppose killing human beings, uh, whether they're in the womb or whether they have been born and they're out of the womb. That should be something that we uh, oppose. And so there's some reasons in that article, and so I'd encourage you uh, to take some time to read that this week on the church blog and to be in prayer for our nation, uh, for our state, as uh, we'll be voting on a bill about that later this year. And uh, so be in prayer about that, that God would move the hearts of people to support life and protect the lives of the unborn. This morning, we are returning to our study of 1 Corinthians. We are at the end of chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts boast in the Lord. Now this paragraph is part of a, a longer section in 1 Corinthians that is addressing division in the church at Corinth. The Corinthians had separated into various factions in the church, and these factions revolved around a spiritual leader, Paul or Peter or Apollos, or even Christ himself. Uh, now, the leaders weren't creating these factions. The leaders weren't saying, well, I'm better than Peter, or I'm better than Paul, or I'm better than Apollos, and so on. But the people had aligned themselves with particular teachers and divided the church into these various groups. And they did this because they were seeking status and honor within the congregation. They wanted to be important. And so somebody came along and said, you know, I got saved under the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Isn't that something? I heard Paul preach. I think he might even know my name. And I got saved. I am of Paul. And somebody else said, well, Paul's good in everything, but you know who's a really great preacher, even better than Paul? Apollos. And guess who I got saved listening to? <laughs> Apollos. And I bought his study Bible, and I am a disciple of Apollos. And then somebody else came along and said, yeah, Apollos is good. But you know that guy named Peter? He was maybe the leader of the 12. Maybe you've heard of him. I got saved listening to him. And uh, I am a disciple of Peter. And then somebody else in the church came along and said, I didn't really need any human beings to lead me to the Lord. <laughs> it was just me and my Bible one night at home. And I was born again without any human person involved. And I am clearly the most spiritual of all because I am sensitive to the word of God intuitively on my own. And everyone in the church is trying to exalt themselves and impress others and obtain rank and status in the church against their brothers and sisters in Christ by aligning themselves with teachers and trying to boost their prestige. And Paul addresses this problem head on, and he reminds them that if you're seeking honor for yourself as a Christian, that is contrary to the whole way that Paul preached the gospel among them, and it in fact contradicts the message of the gospel itself. Paul didn't seek to honor himself in ministry. 
He was just a herald of Christ's message. And the message that he preached was not a message that was exceptional to the world because it was the word of the cross. The most unimpressive, objectionable center of any good news ever. Nothing to brag about in the world. It was a message about a crucified Messiah. And the Jews heard that and said, that's a stumbling block. That's objectionable. The Gentiles heard it and said, that is foolishness. Only a fool would believe a message like that. Only a fool would trust in a crucified Messiah. But God designed ministry this way, that people would be saved as a message is preached about a crucified Messiah. And he did this to confound the wisdom of the wise in this age. God is demonstrating by saving sinners through the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel that what the world calls foolish is wiser than anything they've ever come up with. And what the world calls weakness is stronger than any idea they've ever devised. The Corinthians then, far from seeking to be considered wise or strong by worldly standards, should glory in the foolishness and the weakness of the cross. They should not be like unbelievers, clamoring after worldly status and prestige and trying to outdo one another with their importance in the kingdom of God. To live like the world, to impress the world, or even just to impress people in the church divides the church, and it corrupts the gospel. Now, there's a second problem that Paul has to address that's creating this division in the church with the way these Corinthians were living, and that problem revolves around boasting. Boasting. Now, if you have honor, if you have status, if you have rank... You don't want to keep quiet about it, do you? Of course not. People need to know how great you are. People need to know how important you are. You can't keep quiet about your significance when you've worked so hard for it. And so the natural outcome then of seeking honor and prestige for yourself, seeking to be better than others is, I have to make sure you know that I'm better than you. I have to make sure you know that I'm more important than you, that I have a higher rank than you. And so you boast about your accomplishments. You boast about your achievements. You exalt yourself because of your status and your rank in the world. If you have money, people need to know that you have money. And so you live in such a way to make sure that those who have less than you know that you have more than they do. If you have a title, you make sure everyone calls you by that title. Uh, Mr. Brunanski, excuse me? That's Dr. Brunanski to you. <laughs> doctor, I'm gonna make sure my doctor knows I'm a doctor too, right? It's important, he needs to know. You have a position, you make sure people know your position, how important you are. You know what, we're all prone to this kind of boasting. Nobody's exempt from this. No one wants to feel insignificant. No one wants to feel unimportant. No one wants to feel like they have nothing to contribute and no status. And we often find our identity in what matters in the eyes of the world. And we feel good about ourselves based on what we have done in our careers or in our education or in our personal lives or in some accomplishments. And and when we've done well, there is a part inside all of us that says, someone else needs to know. We enjoy the approval of other people. We enjoy the praise of other people. Even if as believers we know we shouldn't live for the applause of men, we like it. We want it. Anyone who tells you, I don't care if people speak well of me. I don't care if they compliment me. I don't care if they have a high view of me. Is lying. We all care. It matters to all of us. We all battle pride. No one has ever mastered this sin. And, and so we find subtle ways, or maybe even sometimes not so subtle ways, of getting people's approval. One place that is ripe for this is social media, isn't it? It is on social media that we have perfected the art of the humble brag. 
And pastors have to be really careful about this. There's one, that, that's one reason I'm not on social media. I do not trust myself to have uh, my phone a tweet away from saying something really stupid. There's a reason hours are spent on these sermons before I say anything in the pulpit. You gotta be careful. I mean, it would be easy to post something like this. So humbled that God has allowed me to pastor a church of over a thousand people every Sunday. <laughs> so humbled. Or I wasn't preaching this week, so I took a turn serving in the nursery. It's all for Jesus. Little picture of me holding a baby, you know? <laughs> it's not just pastors that do that, though, is it? We can all be prone to that. We, we want to find some way, some little way, even if it's small, to let you know what we've done, how important we are, something significant, so that you will think well of us. And so Paul looks at this concept of boasting, this problem of boasting in verses 26 through 31. And here's Paul's conclusion about boasting. I'll tell you the end at the beginning. Christian, you should boast a lot. You should boast all the time. Nobody, nobody should boast more than followers of Jesus Christ. But there's a catch. You only get to boast about one thing. And it's in verse 31. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let him who boasts, boast about Jesus. Boast about what God has done. We should have frequent boasting, continuous boasting, nonstop boasting about the Lord. We should be people who exult in the Lord Jesus Christ, who can't stop telling other people not how great we are, but how great he is, who lift up and praise him at every opportunity because boasting in the Lord is the boast of the humble. Humble people are not characterized by an absence of boasting, but by boasting about the right person and what he has done. You say, well, how do we... Do that. And that's the catch. I mean, it's easy to say, don't boast about yourself, boast in the Lord. It's hard to do. I mean, just naturally, we come back again and again to tooting our own horn. And so how do we shift in our minds so that we talk more about Jesus and less about us? Paul's gonna give us a prescription for that in verses 26 through 31. And there are three truths that we must embrace that must control our thinking if we would be the kind of people who boast in the Lord rather than in ourselves. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to get through one of these three this morning, okay? Some of you are going to start sweating as the clock goes, and I'm still on point one. If I don't tell you that, you're going to get really anxious. We're not going to get through more than one, okay? So don't worry that we're still in point one at 1145. Here's the first thing you have to embrace, all right? If you want to boast in the Lord, you have to understand your earthly position. Your earthly position. We need to know our earthly position. We need to have a deep understanding of this. You've got to have a realistic view of ourselves. Look at verse 26. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. We want to boast. We want to brag, we want to show off our pedigree, and, and the Apostle Paul comes along and says, what exactly do you have to boast about again? In, in what ways are you important? What status or power or rank do we really have? You know, when Paul wrote verse 26, he wrote a dangerous verse. This is a dangerous sermon. Because this verse is so offensive to our pride. And Paul risked alienating and offending the whole church at Corinth. But he comes along and he calls them brothers because he wants them to understand he's not setting himself above them as if he's not prone to the same struggle. In fact, Paul was so prone to boasting that God had to give him a messenger of Satan to keep him humble, right? Paul knew this struggle. 
He lived this. He's not saying, look, I've got it down, you down there, you gotta figure it out. He says, brothers, I'm one of you. We're all at the same level. And, 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 and who are we? What, what were any of us when God called us? Look, he tells him, consider your calling. Consider your calling. This word consider has the idea of mental reflection. Think about it. Not just in passing, but meditate on it. Take a step back. Be honest with yourself. Analyze this well. Don't just superficially think about what was happening when you were a Christian, but spend some time thinking about what your status was when God called you. Think about your calling. What is this calling that he's talking about? Well, sometimes we use the word calling to refer to a vocational call. I might say God called me to be a pastor. Or my wife might say God called me to be a mother. Somebody else might say God called me to be an engineer or a fireman or whatever it might be. Paul's not using that term in the vocational sense here. He's using it the way he's been using it in this chapter. And in verse 2 of chapter 1, he tells the Corinthians that they are saints by calling. God has called you to be something. To be what? To be holy. To be a saint. That's your calling. You are set apart as holy for God by the call of God. In, in verse 9, Paul told the Corinthians that they were called into fellowship with God's son, Jesus Christ. You were called to be holy and you were called to do something. What are you called to do? Fellowship with Christ. Have a relationship with Jesus Christ. When God called them as saints and, and he set them apart as his special people for himself, he called them to be in relationship with him. And then in verse 24, Paul calls all believers the called. That's what you are. You are, are you in Christ? God called you. He called you out of darkness into light. Christians are people who have been called by God. Like Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb and gave him life. We have been spiritually called out of spiritual death into eternal life. And in Christ, we have been called alive. So we're the called because we have been called to holiness, called to a relationship with Christ, called out of death into life. And this is what he's talking about in verse 26. Consider when God did this for you. There you were, living your life, living for yourself, living for sin, no care in the world. And boom, God calls you through the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are leveled. You see you need a savior. Your sin overwhelms your soul and you see the only solution is hanging on a cross and risen from the dead, the Lord Jesus Christ at the right hand of God the Father interceding for all those who call upon him and you call upon him because God called you. What was going on in your life when that happened? Who were you when you were saved? What was your status when God summoned you to himself? Essentially, Paul is asking the Corinthians to answer this question. It's a significant question. What kind of people does God primarily save? What kind of people does God primarily save? And you can answer that question, he tells them, by looking around at the people at church with you. You see those people that are sitting around you? Those are the people God saves. And those are the kind of people that God saves. Look at the church. Look at the membership roles. And look at what kind of people dominate the membership roles. That's the kind of people that God saves. Now, it's a little risky if Paul doesn't delineate specifically for the Corinthians what kind of people they are, right? You don't want to leave this up to their imagination. So Paul tells them what they were not to help them see what they are. And he essentially says there were three groups missing for the most part. There were not many, he says, wise according to the flesh. You look around the church, not many wise in the eyes of the world that have become members of the church. Look at the congregation. How many philosophers do you see? How many of the world's respected thinkers are on the membership roles of the church? How many members of the church are getting called by the nightly news to come on and share an opinion about world events or give advice to people about how best to live in this world? And the answer evidently is not many. Not very many of the great thinkers find their way into the church. Not many of the philosophers are saved. Not many of the, of the influential, wise intellectuals are saved. 
Maybe one or two in the church in Corinth were considered wise by the world standards when they were converted, but they were the exception, not the rule. The vast majority of the membership, according to the world, were not wise. Not many, he goes on. Mighty. The word mighty is not physically strong. It's influential, social strength, political power, social clout. These are the world's power brokers. They're the ones who make things happen in the world, who dictate the direction of politics and trends and what is popular. These are the people that have positions of influence and power in the culture. They, they could be politicians who make laws and decide who will govern and who will not. Or they might be businessmen who influence the economy. Or fashion gurus who influence trends or entertainers or whatever it might be. In our world, we think about those who have power over the entertainment and over the media. We might think about those who make decisions about what social messaging is going to be written in the end zones of a football field during an NFL playoff game. You know those words don't just magically appear, right? Someone, somewhere, says this is what's gonna be there. And they have that power to show that message to the millions of people that watch. Or what is, they, they decide what is politically correct or what is incorrect to say. They decide who gets a voice in the media. They decide who gets to be on social media, who doesn't get to be on social media, and who's still on social media, but we put them so far down the algorithm, they might as well no longer be on social media. That's not an accident. Those things don't happen by chance. People in our world have power, and they make those decisions so that those things happen. We might think of during COVID, and who got to decide uh, if masks were required or not required? If you could go somewhere unvaccinated or if you had to be vaccinated? Which establishments were essential and got to be open and which ones were non-essential and had to close? That didn't just appear out of thin air. Someone or a group of people had the power to make those decisions and enforce them. These are the world's power brokers, the mighty in the world. They influence every area of life. And Paul tells the Corinthians to look around their church and see how many of them have that kind of influence. How many of them get to decide what the world sees in an NFL end zone or a Major League Baseball field or an NBA court? How many of them get to decide when there's a, an outbreak of a virus what the response is going to be and not going to be? How many of them get to decide who's on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and YouTube and who isn't? How many Corinthians set this policy for the city of Corinth? How many of them owned a media company? How many of them had influence in what happened in the Roman Empire? How many of them set the curriculum and standards for education for the children in Corinth? And the answer of that for Paul is, you know what, you look around your church, there's not many of you that have that kind of influence, if any. Maybe one person. It's possible that none of them did. Then Paul adds that not many of them were noble. That word noble means well-born in Greek. It's a compound Greek word from the word well or good and the word born. And it makes sense in the Greco-Roman world that we would translate well-born as noble because they had the caste system. If you were well-born, you were noble. And if you weren't well-born, you were never gonna be noble because everybody who was noble would make sure you never got any higher than a certain level. That was how the system worked. It was alive and well in the first century in the Greco-Roman society. And so these noblemen are the well-to-dos, typically the rich, those with estates and, and wealth and property. And, and Paul says, look around. How many noblemen do you see showing up on Sunday morning at church? Not many. Not many. In America today, we don't have the same type of system, but we see this reflected in a couple different ways. One is what we might call families that are political dynasties. If your last name is Kennedy, Bush, Clinton, are you gonna be treated like Brunansky? Nope. <laughs> You're not. These are political dynasties. These are the nobility of America. They can get away with things that none of us could get away with. And, and we may not like it. We may think that's not fair. That's not how our system was designed to be run. But guess what? That's how it is. And the people who run the system are always going to make sure that they can game the system. 
That's how it was in Paul's day. That's how it is in our day. We also see families that are extremely wealthy. We might think of in the past the Rockefeller family. I mean, they were American nobility. Or we might think today of many families that have incredible wealth. We might think of the Gates family or the Trump family or the Hilton family. These are people with influence, with clout, with significance and fame because of their wealth. And and we can see in our society today too that there are certain classes of people that are treated as nobility because of their success in entertainment or in sports. We might think about somebody like Tom Hanks or the most popular actress alive today, Sandra Bullock. It is. She's the most popular actress alive today. And she's not treated like you and I would be treated when we go places. Tom Hanks certainly isn't treated like the average person. We might think of sports figures like LeBron James or Phoenix Sun star Devin Booker or Shohei Otani for the Angels, or now the Dodgers, boo, but it's a different story. (laughs) These are the people who are considered a cut above everyone else, right? Significant, important. The other night we went out to a restaurant, we placed an online order to go pick up our food, and I went, me and the boys went to pick it up, and it was supposed to be ready at a certain time. We show up at that time, and it wasn't ready. And the queue for the people that just walk in off the street was to the door, and the whole queue emptied while I was standing there, and it refilled, and then it emptied again. And I still didn't have my dinner, and my family's dinner, so I finally asked, you know, what is going on? That I've been here 30 minutes past the time. Oh, well, we're short-staffed fulfilling online orders. And I can guarantee that if Devin Booker had walked into that restaurant and said my online order was supposed to be ready at 6.50, they would have found some staff to get back there and made it, right? But Rob Bernanski walks in, it's like, just stand over there, we'll, you, you'll get it when it's done. That's how it works. We all understand that. There are people who are noble in society. They get special treatment. They get preferential treatment. That, that's the way things work. If you're an athlete, a musician, a movie star, uh, you are treated as the well-born, the nobility. Now Paul says, look around your church family. Are there superstars there? Are there the ultra-rich there? Are there the well-born, the nobility? Not many of them, if any. When God called them to fellowship with his son, the vast majority of them were not wise or powerful or noble. And that was their earthly position. What is our earthly position? Low. Insignificant. To society as a whole, irrelevant. People who are of no importance. The nobodies. That's who fills the church. Now, you might think to yourself, well, yeah, but I mean, that, maybe that was just Corinth. And maybe just the gospel, for whatever reason, God only called those who were not wise and noble and mighty. But other times, God does call the wise and the noble and the mighty. And so, maybe we have something to boast about because maybe we are something special. Let me show you that this is always God's method. Paul is not uniquely identifying this to Corinth. This is what God does. This is how God works. These are the people God is primarily saving. The most unlikely people, the most unknown people, the most obscure people, the people that no one else sees as important or noteworthy. We can go back to the Old Testament, Genesis 25. We've got Isaac, who also was an unlikely choice. In fact, Abraham didn't even want Isaac to be the child of promise. He begged God that Ishmael might be the child of promise. And God said, no, through Isaac, your descendants shall be called. And then Isaac has a wife named Rebecca. She gets pregnant with twins. And the assumption is, when these two babies are born, the first one out is going to be the child of promise. Inherit the promise from God. Be the one that God's going to use. Be the one that God's going to choose. And then God says this to Rebecca in Genesis 25, 23. Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body, and one people shall be stronger than the other. And everyone at that point in verse 23 would think to themselves, it's the older one. He's going to be stronger. God says this, and the older shall serve the younger. What? That's, God, that's not how it works. 
Don't you understand the way the world works? You see, the younger serves the older. And the older rules over the younger. God says, not, that's not the way it works for me. I overrule the way it works in the world. And God has his own way of doing things. And he says, no, the younger will rule over the older, and the older will serve the younger. And Jacob was chosen, and Esau did not partake of the promise of God because he loved wickedness. Then we come to the Exodus. I mean, we could look at other things, but we come to the Exodus, and we find another surprise pick by God, Moses. Now, you might think to yourself, well, wait a minute now. Moses is the second most important prophet in the Old Testament. John the Baptist is number one, and we know that because Jesus told us that. We probably wouldn't put John number one if Jesus hadn't told us that. But Jesus told us John was number one, and then Moses has to be number two. I mean, he wrote the whole Decalogue. He wrote the five books that start the Bible. The, the foundation of the rest of Scripture was written by Moses. He's got to be important. He's got to be significant. If you really think about Moses being chosen by God, it is shocking. It is shocking. First of all, Moses was not the firstborn. Moses had a brother named Aaron. Aaron was three years older than him. And so Moses wasn't even the, the, the primary one, the preeminent one in the family, just in his own family. And God chose Moses rather than Aaron. Aaron was sort of a okay if you need him type of pick, but Moses was the one God came to and chose. Not only this, in the whole drama with Egypt, God bypassed every single ruler of Egypt and every single leader in Israel, and he picked a man who was a coward. Moses kills an Egyptian. And then two Israelites are fighting, and they say, well, are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? And Moses runs away. He enters the witness protection program and goes and moves to nowhere, Middle East. Lives out in the wilderness, in the desert, as a shepherd, because he's scared to death of Pharaoh. Moses doesn't say to those two men, hey look, I'm Moses, and I'm taking us out of here, so get in line. No, Moses says, I'm out of here. I'm scared. Pharaoh's gonna kill me, and I, I wanna live. And, and for 40 years, he's out there in the wilderness, hiding. I mean, if you're going to pick somebody to lead God's people out from under the oppression of one of the most powerful men in the world, you're probably not going to the wilderness to find somebody who's been in hiding for 40 years because they're afraid. God does. That's who God picked. And then when God chooses Moses and calls him, Moses comes up with every excuse in the book as to why God should pick someone else. Well, God, they're not going to listen to me. Don't pick me. God says they'll listen to you. I will make sure they listen to you. Okay, maybe they'll listen, but God, I'm not a good speaker. Who made man's mouth? Who enables him to speak? You'll be, you'll be just fine. Well, I can't do any signs. Throw down your staff. Put your hand in your coat. There are some signs, all right? You can do some signs. Let's go. Moses finally gets to the point. He says, I'm done with the excuses. God, just send somebody else. I don't want to go. I mean, he gets down to the real heart of the issue, right? The real heart of the issue wasn't he was afraid to speak. Or he didn't want to go. He wanted no part of marching into the belly of that beast. There's a reason he was in the wilderness for 40 years, because he was scared of Pharaoh. The last thing he wants to do is march right into Pharaoh's court. And so he says to God, just send somebody else. And the Lord's anger burned against Moses. But he didn't destroy him. He changed him. He transformed him. And little by little, he made Moses into a man of God. I mean, if you were God in, Genesis, or in Exodus 3 and 4, you would have probably said to Moses, and so would I, you know what, Moses, you're a dumpster fire waiting to happen. I'm going to find somebody else. This is going to be a disaster with your attitude. No one picks Moses except God, who picks the most unlikely. Israel asks for a king. Samuel gives him a king, and God starts out by giving a king like they would want, Saul. Oh, Saul, what a choice. Tall, handsome, strong. Everything you want in an earthly leader, Saul has. Charismatic, he might hide by the baggage every once in a while, but but other than that, this is the man. 
total, complete disaster and failure. Abysmal. God's going to replace Saul and teach Israel a lesson about what they should look for in a king. And so he is going to pick David. And he sends Samuel to Jesse's house, David's dad. They say, get all your sons together. We're going to have a feast. We're going to anoint the next king. They all get together. Eliab, the oldest, comes before Samuel. Samuel says, oh, look at this guy. Tall, handsome, strong, powerful. Got to be this guy. God says, no. Next son, no. Next son, no. They get through all the sons that are present for the dinner. No, 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 no. Okay. Now what, God? They're, we're out of sons, so what next? Uh, Jesse, you got any other kids? Because... God said no to all the, oh, well, yeah, we do have the youngest, but we didn't even bother to invite him. No way he's going to be the chosen of God. I mean, we've got him out with the animals where he belongs. Who brings the baby in? The insignificant one. The least important member of the family. Samuel says, you better call him in. God says, that's the one. His own dad didn't even invite him to the dinner, and God said, he's the one. Jeremiah the prophet God calls Jeremiah in chapter 1. It's such a great passage. God says in verse 4, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah, you think, goes, Yes! Chosen by God! I made it! Can't believe it! I am ready! Send me, God! Listen to his response. Then I said, Alas, Lord God! Alas, Lord God, is sort of like, I'm finished. I'm done. This is not good. Behold, I do not know how to speak because I'm a youth. Uh, God, are you sure you've got the right address? I mean, I wouldn't even pick me. Why are you picking me? Jeremiah becomes the prophet who prophesies of the glories of the new covenant, isn't he? God called him. Even he didn't think he should be called, and God called him. We come to the New Testament, we find the same thing. Before Jesus is born, who does God pick to be his parents? His adopted father and his mother. Joseph, who's a carpenter, basically a lower class worker. You don't ever think about Joseph unless you need a door or a wall built or something like that. He's not a guy that you're thinking of as important. And then Mary... Young girl, just a slave of the Lord, she calls herself. Think about the disciples. Who did Jesus choose? Well, for the most part, Jesus chose Galilean fishermen. Jesus had 12 disciples. 11 of them came from Galilee. One of them came from Judea. Judea is the power center of Israel because it's where Jerusalem was in the south. The one that came from Judea, Judas Iscariot. The other 11 are from the flyover country, right? Jesus isn't going to the Ivy League halls. He's not going to Hollywood. Uh, He's not going to Washington, D.C. He's not going to the state capitol. He's going where no one else would look. And he's calling his disciples from people that no one else had any time for or any use for, including even a tax collector, Matthew. Jesus sums this up in Matthew 11. Look at Matthew 11:25. 11, Matthew 11:25, 11, Jesus after condemning unrepentant cities in Israel that did not hear his message said this. At that time Jesus said, "I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants." Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. Jesus praises God. Why? Because God has hidden the truth from the, the power brokers of the world and the wise of the world and the mighty of the world, and God is saving the nobodies. And Jesus says God was well-pleased with this. God loves saving people that no one else even notices are there. And Jesus embodied this in his ministry. In Luke 7, when a Pharisee invites him over for dinner, we might think, oh, yes, a Pharisee's going to get saved. Things are going to turn around. Except the Pharisee, as soon as a sinful woman comes in and starts wiping Jesus' feet with 
her hair and washing his feet with her tears says if Jesus knew who this woman, Jesus would know who she was if he was a prophet. Unbeliever, can't see who Jesus is, totally blind. And here comes this woman who's a sinner, probably a prostitute. Jesus calls her out of darkness into light. Saves the woman nobody even wanted to be at the dinner. And we don't know that Jesus saved anybody else who was there. In Luke 19, the whole town gets together because Jesus is coming. Got to see Jesus. And there's a little guy, short little guy, really wants to see Jesus, but he's not even tall enough to see over some of the kids. So he decides to climb a tree. His name was Zacchaeus because he wanted to get a good view of Jesus coming down the road. All those people there, he was the chief tax, he was the most hated person in town. All of those people gather, Jesus walks up to Zacchaeus and says, calling you, come into your house. How shocking. Jesus picks the person everyone else wanted to run out of town. Jesus picks him to save him. In John 4, Jesus goes to a village of Samaritans. First of all, that in and of itself, intolerable. Why would God ever want to save a Samaritan? But if, as if that's not bad enough, Jesus talks to a woman, which was a huge strike against anyone in that culture. Jesus doesn't go to the well and say, you know what, hey, uh, lady, can you uh, go get the mayor for me? I, gotta t- I want to talk to somebody important around here. He says to her, can I have a drink? The disciples even were astonished. Why is Jesus talking to a Samaritan Woman, by the way, she wasn't just a Samaritan woman. She was living in sexual immorality because she was living with a man who wasn't her husband. And she had been divorced five times. This is the outcast of outcasts. A woman who's a Samaritan, who's multi-time divorced and now living sexually immorally with a man who she's not married to. Jesus could have gone to any place in Samaria He picked her. Amazing. In John 9, Jesus picks and calls a man who was born blind. Total outcast. No one has any use for a blind man. The only thing that blind people do is take up space in the temple complex and eat free meals that are donated. That's it. Useless, worthless human being. Not to Jesus Jesus finds the downtrodden, and he calls them. Jesus encountered somebody who was rich and powerful in Luke 18. And this man came to Jesus, and he says, what do I have to do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, "Uh, keep the commandments. And the man says, check, 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 done all that, now what? Jesus said, sell everything you have, give it all away to the poor, and follow me. And we read that the man went away sad because he had much wealth and he wasn't saved. Not many rich, noble, well-born, mighty. Jesus, in fact, said this, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And then when Jesus spoke before his death to the rich and powerful political elites of Israel, he said this in Matthew 21, 31, and 32, truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. And you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterward so as to believe him. You're more likely to have a church made up of prostitutes than political rulers, Jesus is saying. Saved, redeemed, transformed prostitutes. More of them are getting in the kingdom than the noble, the mighty, and the wise. Two rich men did believe in Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea, who was rich, and Nicodemus the Pharisee, just two. Not many wise, not many mighty, 
not many noble. When a noble woman of England named Selina Hastings came to faith in Christ in the 18th century, she famously recited 1 Corinthians 126. And she said that she thanked God that the verse said, not many, rather than not any. And she went on to add that she was saved by the letter M. Sometimes God calls those who are wise and mighty and noble, but his overriding pattern is to call those who are nobodies. The Jacobs, the Moseses, the Davids, the Ruths, the Rahabs, the Joseph and Marys, the disciples, the sinful woman, the Samaritans, the Zacchaeuses of the world, the blind men of the world. That's what most of us are. The unknown, the unimportant. And that's one reason why our boasting, now that we are in Christ, is so utterly reprehensible to God. Our earthly position was nothing to boast of when we were unsaved. And do we really think that God called us by the grace of his son so that we could now tell everyone how great we are? Unthinkable. The Corinthians were busy stepping on one another, trying to climb the earthly ladder of success, and Paul reminds them of how foolish it is to boast in themselves, especially when they think about their calling as the nobodies of the world that God has made sons of the king. This is a rebuke to the proud, but this is a fountain of life to the humble. When you know that you are nobody important, that you have nothing to offer God, that you are insignificant, that you are a sinner, an outcast, deplorable in the eyes of the world, and you hear that God saves those who are deplorable and sinful and outcasts and blind and nobodies and have nothing, that is the best news you could ever hear. What a glorious reality to know that God calls the nothings and the cast-offs and the useless and the anonymous and the broken and the sinners to repentance. You might be thinking to yourself this morning, I'm not good enough to be a Christian. And the good news of the gospel is that God is only calling those who are not good enough and know it. Most people in the world think they're good enough to receive God's approval, and they are rejected. God calls those who know they don't deserve it. He calls the nobodies. God is not looking for those who think they're good enough. God is calling the infants, the blind, the foolish, the helpless, the abandoned, those who know they need to be delivered because they have nothing to offer God. Now you might be wondering at this point, why does God do this? I mean, this is the most backwards way of working imaginable. I mean, wouldn't the gospel be better served if the person who runs Disney got saved and turned Disney into an apparatus of the gospel? Why is God doing it this way so that it is the people who don't have the platforms and the influence and the power and the money who are getting saved? And we're going to answer why God does it that way next week. So you're going to have to come back. Let's close in prayer.